Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Metro 2033 Redux Review Reload Reengage Retard. That's good by Jocko Retard. So let's get into the review. Let's get into the meat of Metro. There's a lot of it. I don't know if you noticed, there was that whole section towards the end where we were fighting the Overmind and he was throwing Hydralisk projectiles at me. I don't know what that was all about, but this is a very strange title, evidently. Um, very schizophrenic in many different ways. It kind of reminded me of Dead Space towards the end, based on the fact that the organic assets were all utter garbage. You know, you had some interesting monster design here and there, but it really just went to shit towards the end. And I mean that in many different ways, across many different contexts. So you have the idea of the various monsters of Metro. And the monster design, like I said, had some high points, but mostly had some low points. A lot of this stuff was just generic. Having a mutated gorilla or whatever the fuck those Mongo guys were, they were consolidated to one area in the entire game, never seen before, never seen after. I mean, they were towards the tail end of the game, but we never got an opportunity to see them in the tower in the final chapter, and we never got an opportunity to see them anywhere else. So it really boggles the mind as to why you would even bother messing around with those units, those enemies, if you weren't going to have the player face them in other areas. They just felt like a gimmick. Almost like if you were on a vehicle, for example, and like Gears of War 1 has an example of this that I very often share in these sorts of contexts when talking about gimmick areas in a video game. You get to use a vehicle in one section of a shooter, and then, you know, up until that point, you've never used it. And after that point, you never use it. And it's not even like you're using a shooter on a giant spaceship or something like a giant vehicle. Uh, like you're still using your shooter shooting mechanics, right? Uh, that would be something different than sort of like the terrain around you is changing because you're on a vehicle and you're shooting. It's just like you're in a vehicle, you're piloting a vehicle. Okay. Sort of like that crane, I guess, in uh, the Overmind section of this game. But still, it's just, it, it's very bizarre. Like, why would you just throw in an enemy as a part of a set piece, but then never have them show up again, you know, before or again? I, I get the feeling that actually a lot of this game makes more sense or was designed for people who had read the book, people who had bothered to go back and read that book uh, before playing the game, or maybe read it after they play the game and now suddenly things make more sense. But I'm also very, you know, conscious of the idea that a lot of people don't really bother um, transliterating or translating, rather, the, uh, you know, elements of a book properly to a movie or a game. You know, whenever you're you're adapting something to another media or medium, it doesn't usually end very well for the source material. And since I hold these two opinions simultaneously, these two assumptions simultaneously, that if you're, you know, porting something for, or adapting something from one medium to another, you're odds are you're going to do a bad job of it because that's how everybody has done it. Like, that's the industry standard is to do a really poor job of it. Handle the source material poorly. Handle your own new things poorly. Like, look at the Arkham games, for example. And then you look at the other assumption that I have, which is maybe it makes more sense if you read the book. They almost seem like they counter each other. They cancel each other out. But... I actually do think that maybe if you're familiar with the source material, maybe if you've played the game before you played the Redux even, you might have more of an idea of what the hell's happening in this title. But for example, when you're facing Mongo in his jungle den, uh, you're sort of going through this infested gorilla area, and before you get there, like it says you're about to stare fear in the face, and they show you a preview of Mongo. And it's like... Am I supposed to know what Mongo is? Like, am I supposed to already know what that enemy is? That's sort of what I was thinking in the back of my head when I was going into that section. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Is this what that Russian guy described when he wrote the uh, Metro novels or whatever that, our, you know, this game is built around? So... It's just so bizarre. It doesn't really make any sense. I also really don't understand this decision to make the character a silent protagonist because he doesn't remain silent entirely. He just doesn't speak during gameplay, but he'll speak beforehand narration-wise. He'll, he'll narrate some passages of his journal, presumably. Uh, and I guess those are meant to be taken from the game. You know, he says, like, he's going to stare fear uh, in directly in the eyes. And that's what the whole Mongo thing is. And that's why I was so perplexed. Like, maybe this makes a lot more sense if you read the book. Maybe you know what he's talking about then. And that's like a little reference there, an Easter egg for those people who have read the book. But it still felt like a non sequitur. Like, that whole area felt like a non sequitur. Why are we journeying through this area shooting Mongo? Or running away from Mongo, more accurately. It's just, it's so bizarre. 
really, I feel like what this campaign, what this uh, story mode and this game overall needed, right? This is a single player game. There's no multiplayer. So uh, what this game needed was like a, a real singular sort of conclusion that we were fighting towards or, or striving to achieve and like a final objective. And for a while, that's going to pull us to inform everybody of Hunter's uh, last message. You know, you're carrying his uh, dog tag and, you know, he hasn't returned from his journey. And I thought that there was going to be some thing where we were going to be reuniting with Hunter. But I guess he just unceremoniously dies off screen. That's sort of what you're led to believe anyways. Maybe he comes back in the sequel or something. So... When Hunter ends up being dead forever, like we hadn't finished the game, we ever, to my knowledge, we never interact with him after he departs the station. We already have opened up with such a weird, seemingly non sequitur, um, eight days into the future, like prologue. And then we could jump back eight days, we get Hunter's message, we go off on our journey. Like, it already feels a little schizophrenic to begin with, but I'm willing to pardon that because I just played Dark Void earlier, not this year, but last year. And. That was already pretty psychotic, but it had a similar sort of, like, retarded prologue that really didn't feel like it fit in with anything else. And so I'm I'm not really willing to forgive it or look past it, but I won't let it destroy any other element of the story because I'm already sort of understanding that th this is something that people like to do. Especially when it comes to books, people feel like they can't just start you off in the middle of the story but they've, they've got to have a reason to start you off in the middle of the story. So they take this like weird shortcut where they say, hey, narratively, you're going to be jumped right in the middle of the story. You're going to be jumped right in the middle of the narrative. Here you go. Here's what's happening. Here's what's happening in this story. You're fighting all these enemies. You're using all these advanced weaponry. You're engaging with the game's mechanics. You're, you're sort of figuring stuff out. And then after all of like, you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or however long it is, it varies from game to game, from book to book, you know, how long that chapter ends up being. Uh, let, let's flash back. Let's go back into the past and you'll see how we got there. And it's supposed to be like some weird narrative hook, but it really just feels like a cheap crutch for poor writing. Like, why can't you just start me off in the middle of the story and then let me see where it goes and make something engaging from that point onward? That would be my critique levied at this title immediately. And as the police roll up in the background, I'm sure you can hear them, they are very active today, arresting all of those dark ones that we, uh, unbeknownst to them, annihilated at the end of this title. Let's talk a little bit more about the narrative structure of this game and what I felt was lackluster. Because really, like I said, I feel like it lacked a, a real goal to move towards. I guess the overarching goal was to save your city, your, your underground metropolis outpost. Or, or not metropolis, but metro station. Your, your station, that's the word that they were using. So you have to save your station from the Dark Ones. That's sort of what you're expected to do. That, that, that is your overarching goal. But at no point am I expected to believe that the Dark Ones are, like, where we're aiming lasers at. Like, we don't really know what the means are. We just know that, like, to, to as part of our overarching objective to save your station, you have to inform the, the Polis station. I don't know why that specific station or why you can't just go there and... Like, why does it have to be the station that takes the longest and most crazy route to get there where you have to go through communists you have to go through nazis you have to go through mongo territory you have to go through all of these different places to get to polis uh and then it turns out you get there it was a pointless endeavor anyways because they don't even fucking help you and so it just ends up being i guess i should retract that you don't have to go through mongo territory to get to polis you go through mongo after you go to polis but whatever it still ends up you going to mongo so it's it's just a really very strange environment to be in and a strange path to take to your destination and so again during that whole thing like okay at least up until the point where you get to polis you feel like i'm working to get to polis i know what my objective is then after that the narrative just fucking falls apart because now what are we doing now we're getting, uh, we're following this, this, uh, gray beard guy. I don't even remember his name. Miller, maybe we're following his lead. He's going to help us out for some reason. I don't know why he's loyal to us or to Hunter. I guess he's like a ranger or something. And we're supposed to be a ranger as well. I don't know. And, uh, the bottom line is we, we've, you know, he's helping us. We agree to t accept his help because we have no other options. And then we say, okay, let's go to D6. Okay, wh wh what is D6? It's not really explained. It's it, There's not really any background information that you get. There's nothing that says, 
you know, I, I think he says that we have to go to D6 because that's where we're going to get information on or logistics or something related to the missiles that we need to use to launch against the Dark Ones. I don't even know how we know where the Dark Ones are. Like, I, I finished the game, guys. I beat the game, and I don't know why we did what we did or how we knew what we were doing in the last two chapters of the game after Polis was going to help. I still don't even know why we went to Polis to begin with. I guess it was to rally the council. But I didn't even know that we were going to Polis to rally the council until we got to Polis and rallied the fucking council. I didn't know that's what we were supposed to be doing. And this is where the whole story has fallen on its face. On top of that, I would be able to completely forget about the story because I'm going to anyways because it's stupid. I don't give a shit about this story. I didn't read the book. I don't have any prior, you know, attachments to the series, to the franchise, to this idea of what this story is. But if you had made the environments engaging, if you had made them look good and consistent, if you had made the game readable, if you had made the mechanics enjoyable, if you had paced the game properly so that the engagements you had with the enemies of Metro were actually consistent and uninterrupted for a prolonged period of time in each chapter, instead of relying on gimmicks and stupid shit like locking my control away for five second cutscenes every five minutes, then maybe I would have been able to say, you know what, that story is a problem, but at the end of the day, we have an enjoyable, consistent experience to look back on at the end of our review. No, we don't. What we have is a fucking carnival ride. We have a literal on-rails carnival ride just every five seconds or so. Oh yeah, you walk into a door, you get punched in the head by a Nazi. Oops, I know you probably could have just opened the door like any other human being in an FPS where you just tap E and it opens, and then you could have gunned that fucking Nazi down. But like, we just get dragged along for the ride of the narrative, and the gameplay is nowhere near the storytelling of the on-rails cutscenes and the, the dialogue. Like, if you wanted an example of a game where the storytelling had to catch up to the gameplay so frequently that it destroyed any gameplay pacing. First, I would recommend Dead Space. Well, I guess Deadly Premonition probably. Then Dead Space. Then this game. I actually think this game is a lot worse than Dead Space in, in that department because at the very least, we didn't have any cutscenes in that until, I guess, the end probably. Um, but I, I, yeah, I guess the beginning and the end. That was bookended. The game itself was bookended by cutscenes. I'm even okay with chapters in a game being bookended by cutscenes. Or, or state changes or something having a cutscene in there. As long as you give me, like, a prolonged period of time where I'm just playing the game and I'm not being interrupted. Like, I'm pretty forgiving with that sort of stuff. And yet, with this game, you were interrupted, again, every... It felt like every five minutes. It did not feel like I really got into a groove. More often than not, it was just interrupted before I could even say that I was in the middle of doing something. There were a couple of notable exceptions that I uh, cannot remember off the top of my head. Let me see. So there was the uh, Nazi fighting areas, which felt pretty free form uh, in general. And then you got punched in the head by one. Um, yeah, but, but again, like it, it always gets interrupted eventually. But at the very least, that was a little bit longer. You were exploring like the Nazi tunnels and stuff. That was one that I remembered a little bit um, fondly. And, and that was one of the areas where I felt like, well, there could be you know potential to this. It sort of feels like maybe some of the old school... Um, like the Wolfenstein 3D stuff that I had, uh, I have a very passing experience with, a very layman's experience with, where you're, you know, not just because you're shooting Nazis, but also because, you know, it's like you're actually engaging in an FPS and you're fighting enemies. And they're also sort of playing by similar rules, at least on paper. You'd think that they have guns, you have guns, they're human, you're human. Okay, so... I thought that that could have had potential. I, I said at some point, I think it was probably in the second video, because that's the longest one, um... That, uh, oh no, maybe the third one's the longest one. Either way, I said it, I think it was in the second video, because that was where the Nazi stuff happened, where I I felt like there was a really strong case to be made for um, this game being way better. If they removed all of the mutant stuff, they removed the anomaly, they removed the dark ones, and they just focused on, like, the nuclear apocalypse, nuclear winter sets in. Uh, similar to the setting that we have, but instead of a bunch of mutant shit, we just have Nazis, commies, and uh, uninterested third parties like what we are, you know, fighting it out, duking it out. And uh, I guess that actually was the third video that I was thinking of that had that Nazi part because I remember it opened up with a bunch of Gregorian chants of commie troops, so that was just psychotic. But, you know, I, I felt like, you know, commies and not Nazis fighting in tunnels, above ground, in this nuclear winter, like, they had some interesting elements that they could have pulled to make this a more... I guess, homely or intimate experience when, when fighting your fellow man. And 
it, it could have been interesting thematically to show how even in nuclear winter after the apocalypse has already set in we're still fighting over ideology like they sort of make a passing comment at that but they could have made that the focal point i understand that they wanted to tie it into a novel okay whatever and the novel probably had some of these weird monsters and stuff i thought the not the nose elises which it, it turned out to be just like discount longos i guess at the end of the day but the 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 sort of like uh dog things that were attacking us in the overworld uh the not the demons but the ones that are on the ground i thought they had interesting designs just because i hadn't really seen like anything furry uh that was sort of patchy fur and stuff like it, it looked like it was something you would see in a, a mutated apocalypse sort of um a, a little bit more so than some of the other stuff that they came up with like mongo just being this gorilla thing that has no other you know it was not grounded in the environment at all whatsoever whereas you could see them nesting the uh the, those wolf things you could sort of see them nesting around and they had like this one area where there were some babies and stuff which i uh, thought was interesting Unfortunately, not a dynamic event, not something that was just there for you to find. It was very much a set piece that uh, they expected you to look at. And I don't really know why. Like, I don't know what was going on with all that. I don't know why there weren't more elements of them living in these areas like that. That would have been a lot cooler. Uh, but I, I guess everything else, you know, you, the the nose elises, which were just these giant mongoloid things that were discount mongos, the mongos themselves and the demons were all really generic in my eyes and that's where i was talking about monster design earlier in the review i feel like it was just a big swing and a miss where you had the interesting wolf thing that could have been built upon as like your baseline enemy that is the least creative element of your entire production where it's like oh yeah i have a mutant wolf like okay you know that sometimes you it's sort of like dark souls sometimes you need a giant wolf okay well in a post-apocalyptic nuclear winter in russia sometimes you just need these wolves it could have been interesting to see like a mutated bear like if they actually try to make it so that these mutants were a little bit more grounded with whatever they were supposed to be mutant strains of like wolves hunt in packs those wolf things hunted in packs like that felt like a real enemy in a real setting if this setting were real that's sort of something you might expect to be there whereas everything else was just like why the fuck is that there like we don't even get mutant humans or anything we just get mutant fucking mongos and then discount mutant mongos and i don't understand why we got those things like i i don't i really don't understand the demons and the gameplay that a lot of these enemies ended up creating especially the demons and then sh a special shout out to mongo for being a mongoloid uh, you know the, the gameplay or loops around those particular enemies was really really annoying then you had those like prowler things i guess was another enemy that was there um, there's actually quite a few, like, uh, there's probably like, uh, not double digits, but there's probably, I think six or seven enemies that you could potentially, uh, count as a, like an enemy type. Uh, the wolves, the mongos, the nosalises, the demons, uh, the prowler things that went into holes, the scorpions, which just showed up in one area and one area alone, sort of like Mongo, but they had even less screen time. Really confusing. I don't know why the fuck those things were there. Uh, and then there was like the, I think the... Miller guy called them children of the apocalypse or something, which were just these balls, these testicles that came out of these test tu uh, tube things on the walls. These are organic test tubes that would just spit them out. And they didn't appear to have any animations and they just detonated. Like, I don't know what the fuck that was, those are supposed to be. I don't know how those could possibly have been mutated uh, as a result of like that. That looks like nothing like I, not only does that not fit with the setting in my eyes, it also doesn't really feel like anything that would ever appear in any other context. Like, it almost looks like an alien. As, and not in, an, like, a good sense where it's like, well, what if aliens came to Earth and did this? Like, no. What, why, why would any alien look like that? Why would anything evolve into that? You know, there, there seems to be no reason for it to exist. Like, I can't even understand what the developers thought they were doing with that. So it's really psychotic. And so, uh, yeah. I think I'll leave it at that for the monster design. That was uh, all I really had to say. Like I said, the gameplay created around a lot of these enemies is more important than their actual designs, to be fair, but also terrible in this game. I thought the Nozalises and the wolves ended up behaving exactly the same. Um, I think the wolves were a little bit more annoying to deal with because when they did attack, they attacked in greater number and it f further exposed this game's lack of a soundstage where they would be right next to you and you would have no idea... I guess this, if anybody's familiar with the 2016 Doom title, it had a similar issue where the soundstage, everything was so loud and noisy already and distracting on top of itself that you would never be able to hear enemies behind you. And, you know, to be fair, in that game, you were moving a lot more than in this one. 
but you still would benefit from having actual audio. And so I think you would have had to turn the music off entirely or something in order to hear enemies making footsteps behind you and stuff. Whereas uh, in this title, it was just a mess to look at, let alone actually hear stuff. And that was because of the overabundance of screen effects that they put on. Uh, most of this game, I feel, is, or at least a good chunk, like it's probably 50-50 in actuality, is spent with your gas mask on. And I really, really regretted the fact that they included all of these screen effects. I'm hoping that when I go back and play this game in a, uh, you know, a pre-Redux era, you know, a 2010 edition of the title, I'm hoping that that doesn't happen. I'm hoping that we don't have those issues. Because that was really insane to me that there was that many screen effects, that much post-processing slapped onto the screen. It made me sick. It made me dizzy. gave me headaches. It was terrible. I'm not normally somebody who's super, like... Uh, you know, susceptible to those kinds of effects from just looking at a game. Like, I don't ever pay attention to those warnings that talk about nausea and uh, epilepsy. <laughs> but this game really ha was very unsettling for prolonged periods of time. Like, actual pain in the eyeballs. And I would never want to look at it again. So, I don't know. I, I thought I had turned all that stuff off in options, like, as much of that stuff as I could. But really, there should they, it, this isn't something that should be an option to turn off or an option to turn on, like it should be off by default, it shouldn't be there in the game. Like, I don't agree with its inclusion in the game for anybody. Like, I don't think any human being would like looking at that. And if they do, then I want some of what they're on. You know, I don't mean to make a no true Scotsman indirectly. I'm just trying to say that this game really had some abhorrent visuals. And a lot of it was because of whatever those screen effects were slapped onto top of each other every time you were using your gas mask. It wasn't just the enemy lens flares on the top of their helmets when you were fighting humans. It was also when you were being attacked, when you had blood on your face, it, when you were just walking around like just had the cracks in the in the gas the the condensation like they went into all of this effort they went through all of this pain and technical wizardry and creative expression to try and put together all of these different you know screen effects onto your visor these this does show attention to detail but it misses the obvious issue of this whole fucking thing being really obnoxious to look at and if you try to interact with this game visually you will at some point down the line develop a brain tumor is what I'm fearing. So I'll let you know uh, when I'm setting up my GoFundMe page to get that tumor out of my head. It'll probably be a Russian strain too, knowing this game. So speaking of Russian, I actually did run this game at the beginning of the game was English audio, and then we switched it to Russian audio for the rest because I thought maybe it would be a little bit more uh, immersive. I actually wish that there was some sort of option to make every person... Uh, talk in their native language, because there were a couple of times where the German audio was playing, um, well, not the German audio, but like the audio from the German soldiers, and because our audio was set to Russian, those German soldiers were speaking Russian. Like, it's already sort of a stretch for them to be speaking English, and uh, but at least I would have understood if it was supposed to be, again, like a game that was uh, localized. Uh, for English audio. Uh, but for German soldiers to be speaking Russian <laughs> was really... <laughs> Really confusing. It was like six degrees of Schaefer or something. It was really weird. So I would have uh, preferred an option like that, uh, although obviously I am aware that that is uh, probably a niche in thing. It's sort of like uh, I've heard that when you watch anime, a lot of people will recommend you watching dubs of anime, or not watching dubs, avoiding dubs uh, of, of anime. And I, I think that this practice generally uh, in my life, like I watched a German television show called Dark in, I think, 2017. And that show didn't feel right when I was watching it with uh, English audio because uh, it was dubbed. And so I, I opted for English subtitles, German audio, whenever possible in that kind of context. And thankfully, there was an option for that. Whereas in this game, obviously, I, that's sort of the same reason why I went for the Russian audio. But when we were fighting Germans, it doesn't really make any sense for them to be speaking in Russian accents with, uh, obviously, speaking some German like when they would say Scheiser or whatever. But uh, a lot of the time they were speaking Russian, I think. Anyways, could, be, could just be my American brain speaking here, but pretty sure that's what they were doing. So would have vastly preferred uh, an option that, like what I was describing there, where everybody speaks in their realistic language. It's not like we were dealing with a lot of other languages either, but uh, I think it was just Russian and German. So, you know, who knows? 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's one of those things is that just the human condition element of Metro's setting makes it really interesting, I think, for uh, exploring how other people are handling this. Like, how are the the Americans handling it, for example? How are people in other parts of the world handling it? What about the the Asians, you know, over in, the, in China and Japan and everything else? Like, how are they handling all this stuff? What's going on there? Like, I kind of want to know what the, the developer's take would be in that in a a, a detached sense but i have no idea of what they would do with the game so it's kind of pointless in that case and i don't really read a lot of books these days so uh, maybe i need to get back into that to see how well that vision of this author was carried over there but i care way more about that than some ham-fisted fucking monster designs that suck dick so uh obviously i wouldn't really i don't think i would be very interested in the book just on that basis because it seems to be a lot more centered around these anomalies and dark ones and uh, all that stuff that I care for. I'd much prefer the ability to uh, just analyze this setting w human versus human style. And I'm sure that some people were very opposite uh, of me in that regard. I'm sure a lot of people vastly preferred the presence of... Uh, like, uh, you know, the, the they vastly preferred the mutants. They thought that the they were really all about the alien stuff. They really had nothing to, no interest in the human condition aspect of it. Maybe that's just me and what my own interests are. But honestly, like, at least, it, you know, you I don't really have a lot of expectation for when you include human factions in a video game. I don't expect you to be, you know, uh, really talking at length about uh, characterizing them visually different distinctly or whatever although that would be nice in certain respects like their factions for example like oh they should have different uh regalia they should have different emblems uh blah 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 but you know in this case you're just dealing with commies and uh nazis you know soviets and nazis and some non-so soviet uh russians and so it's cool to see like that sort of era but then ported into a fish out of water scenario or I guess these guys are adapted to it, obviously. But for me, it's Fish Out of Water because I've never experienced this game before. This is my first time ever touching it. So I just I feel like they could have done so much more, especially if they just scrapped all that Mongo stuff and got rid of all the mutants. Mongo really just destroys another game, I guess, is really all we can say about that. Barbarian of the North. So uh, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, the gameplay a little bit more, and then we can close out the review, I think. Um realistically speaking when i mentioned the gameplay pacing that really is my biggest complaint regarding it however there are some individual systems in this game that definitely could have used some more tweaking so we look at uh the ranger system which is what we ended up picking we we didn't pick ranger hardcore though i think i probably could have cleared the game with maybe only an hour or so of extra difficulty here and there like extra play time uh, on the Ranger Hardcore difficulty. That's pure speculation. I have no idea. Like, maybe I would have been stuck on this game for, like, 20 hours or something. But uh, the actual playthrough was under 12 hours, I believe. So, um, whatever. Uh, there, there's a little statistic to throw at you. You can come to your own conclusions based on that. However, um, at the same time, with Ranger being my mode that I selected, I was not expecting to have no way to track my ammo outside of stations. I was also not expecting the game to be as linear as it ended up being. And so this is the first main thing that I will throw at you uh, to consider. It's sort of like my Dead Space review when I mentioned that I would have far preferred Dead Space 1 to behave similar to Prey 2017, where you could just sort of go back and forth between the sections of the uh, ship, the Ishimura, uh, at your, at, you know, however you wanted to do it. Um, I think that this game would have vastly, vastly been improved with the option to go back to different stations as long as you kept a good rapport with the people. Uh, sort of stylizing it after a more, you know, RPG-focused approach, I guess, where you can sort of decide, do I want to execute all these people and destroy this town, basically? Uh, you know, have you? then you have all of these other variables, like there's obviously going to be mutant attacks and maybe other human attacks on various posts. So... Are we going to, you know, if I kill too many of these people, I risk that getting overrun by mutants. But if I keep it alive and I keep good rapport with them, that I can go back and forth, you know, between the different stations at, at will and blah, blah, blah. You know, but maybe there's like some other tools to facilitate the uh, no one left alive playthrough approach where maybe there's like some back alleys you can go through to fast travel, quote unquote, or to take shortcuts between the areas. Uh, the loading screens were pretty bad here, too, but I mean, it's a linear title, so it almost doesn't even really matter as much because I was always under the impression when I was complaining about those loading screens in the first and second videos that we would be going back to some of these places eventually. 
Um, but no, they were just stops on your journey. It was a very linear title, very like a book. And I really would have appreciated the ability to keep going back and forth. That That is one of those things where in a book and a TV series, really all you can do is you can turn the page backwards. You can go backwards, but you're not actually going back. The story isn't going back. It's, the game's not following you. You know, the book is not following you. The TV show is not following you back. You're following the television show back. You're just re-watching it or re-reading it or something. In a game, you actually have the power as the developer to empower your players to go back to old areas where they've already gone and further the story there. And, you know, obviously the gameplay is a storytelling tool in this case. The player can decide that they want to go back there for whatever reason they deem reasonable to, uh, you know, achieve that goal or, or attempt that goal is to, you know, set out to travel back. And in a game like this, where the hardships of existing in this sort of society and uh, state where there's all of these different mutants attacking you, all of these different threats, these uh, paramilitary groups that are fighting each other, like there's a lot of elements of this game of this game setting that really would have lended well to the idea that you can continue to explore the setting on your at your own pace, not at the pace of a preset, you know, uh, narrative you know, ripped from a story, uh, a book rather. Um, you know, just let the player tell their own story through the ability to just walk around in that stuff, sort of stuff. So I really would have preferred that. Like I think that this game would have been better served significantly better served by the presence of some sort of mechanic like what was in prey where you could just walk through the area and go back to old stations and stuff and you know the less loading screens the better obviously for something like that but just in general obviously less loading screens the better generally speaking so i don't know i that that is one thing that really bothers me about this game it's sort of like unfinished business sort of like prey at the end of the prey playthrough i was like you know i really would have preferred the ability to go back and, and find my way uh, around this area and and tell my story a little bit differently than what I ended up doing. But even in that game, you still had some tools. In Dead Space and in this game, you had no tools. So Metro 2033 really suffered from that. And I didn't expect, obviously, like if that's how the game was in the 2010 version, right? Which I still have no experience with, I will say. Obviously, as a, a, a consumer, I would not expect that the Redux would change the game so drastically so as to include an RPG mode. I'm just saying that in general, this is a, a complaint that will no doubt exist for the original game as well when I get to it. Uh, I feel like this title really would have benefited from being able to backtrack and decide, I'm going to brave the elements, I'm going to uh, brave the mutants, brave the other human groups, and trek back to station whatever, because I want to talk to somebody who's there, I want to turn in a quest, I want to do this, I want to do that. You know, it just, it feels like it's way too constricted, confined. You, you're given this setting, you're tantalized by this setting that has a lot of potential, especially between human contact, but even with the mutants, whatever, mutant versus humans, you can see what that does to the humans, and there's still some interest there, some intrigue, some elements of of a desire to explore from the player. And, you know, you're really just confined down this one rabbit hole where you must go this direction always. And you don't really have any opportunity to go off the beaten path, not for a prolonged amount of time. So, yeah, I definitely think that this game could have been so much better if it allowed you to, you know, go back and forth between the different stations. So that is one complaint. Like I said, I think that will definitely, uh, you know, follow us as we return to the 2010 edition of the game and see just how bad the Redux fucked up and just how many of these issues were the original game's problems. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be a, a major complaint I have is that they ended up going for such a confined, constrained narrative uh, for the, the game's expression. So aside from that, like I was talking about earlier with ammo, you can't check it in the middle of combat. You're basically get, you know, taking away a lot of the player's ability to make informed decisions because you're taking away all of their abilities to go and check their information. Like you, if you're going to show me how many med kits I have and I guess like how much of a timer I have for like my, my uh, gas mask filters, I don't know what that that clock like thing was on the bottom right, but it was something related to that, I think. And you're going to show me how much ammo I have for these throwable objects. Why would you not allow me to see how much ammo I have on my gun? Again, maybe there's something I missed, in which case, obviously, this particular part of the complaint goes out the window. But if get, judging by the fact that it's shown just when I press tab in the uh, cities, it sh tells me how much I have. I would expect the same thing to be there on the non-ranger modes in-game, uh, like when you're actually in the middle of the... Uh, 
yeah, when you're not stopping at stations and you're actually in the middle of combat or whatever. So I don't know why. Like, I, I'm fine with the HUD being hidden as long as I can check my bullets and stuff beforehand so I know how much I picked up or whatever. That that would have uh, made made it so that I didn't look like as much of an idiot, I think, uh, for one. And also just would have in general uh, made it so that it, it was more about me expressing my skill with the tools I knew I had than a guessing game as to how many tools I had and having to balance that with also executing strategies and stuff. So, yeah, that was tough. The platforming sections in the later stages of the game felt really forced as well. Like, I don't know why you couldn't have just made it so that this was all a cutscene. It sort of felt like that's what the developers wanted to do anyways, and they just made it quick time events and stuff. I don't know why they did that. Quick time events are, are really just a crutch. Like, I, I don't understand why any developer includes them. Like, especially if you're going back and doing a redux of your game, remove the fucking quick time events. Just turn them into cutscenes. It's not like you didn't do that all before anyways. When you have the wave emoji in front of my screen so I press E to open a door, you're locking me out of gameplay for a so whole, like, five seconds of an animation at least. And then you're going to say, oh, yeah, this ladder sequence that takes ten seconds. Oh, yeah, you got a quick time event that. No, fuck you, dude. Just make it so that I jump on the ladder and then enter a cut into a cutscene again these developers are so schizophrenic with what they end up doing that sometimes it's a cutscene, sometimes it's just regular gameplay like you opening a door and then walking in and sometimes it's not sometimes it's not just walking up a ladder you know climbing a ladder sometimes it's uh fucking pressing e to go up it and yes there was that russian guy miller who said staircase instead of ladder good one real, real good prank that was in the overmind section so yeah, I don't know, man. The The fact that there was so much gameplay, so many gameplay interruptions, so few consistent elements of the gameplay itself, he, the developer, I mean, the player in this case, really never had an opportunity to see what the developer was trying to do with this game, is what I feel like. As a player, I did not have any opportunity to really divine and reverse engineer the intent of the developer. Like, I guess that the intent of the developer is to make a confusing mess that triggered me. <laughs> That's what it feels like. More so than, and I don't mean that to take it personally. I mean, like, it feels like they just made a confusing mess because they wanted to make a confusing mess. Like, it doesn't feel like there was a real failure to communicate between the developers at any point. It doesn't, it feels kind of like that with the schizophrenia, where sometimes it's a cutscene and sometimes it's a quick time event and sometimes it's just gameplay. But at the same time, it doesn't really feel. Like, these developers took a swing and a miss, and these are the unintended consequences. It feels like this is the, what the developers wanted to do. But maybe I will find out that that is not the case, again, when I go back and play the 2010 edition. I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, you didn't give this game a fair shout. You, you actually, what you should have done is you should have played the original version. Um, I will. I will just to make sure that I have a, a proper look on this game. But there are some things that are non-negotiable about this title in terms of how bad it ended up being. And the graphics are certainly one of them in this particular instance. Maybe that will be different for the 2010 edition. We'll find out. But uh, I definitely think that the gameplay has a lot of problems. I feel like the, the Ranger mode is built around denying you information. Uh, I do like the idea that combat uh, takes is, is quicker. Time to kill is... Uh, I guess, lower for everything, including myself. I like that because I come from Counter-Strike. When it comes to FPS games, I'm about Counter-Strike. That's what I'm interested in. And so I like the idea that enemies are not bullet sponges, even though they were in this case a lot of the times, especially demons and especially Mongo. But I like the idea in theory that enemies are not bullet sponges. You can kill them with sustained fire if you get the drop on them. It's more about positioning then and more about actually executing your aim. It's less about, you know... Uh, having the right class or modifying your weapons the right way there's it's more you're more free to just use whatever tools you can scrounge up in a survival game like this is meant to be and yet i didn't feel like that was de delivered upon at all and so i i'm not really feeling like i was sold a false bill of goods in that case because i had no pre prior history with deep silver i have no idea what these developers are like i just know that there's um i don't know i i know that there's a lot of issues with uh this game in particular and Coming away from it, I feel like, again, dissatisfied. Like I mentioned in my credits rant, I, I, I feel like I was, um, I feel like I didn't really tap into what this game was all about. Not yet. And so maybe I'll have a more complete picture once I play the 2010 edition. I suspect I will. For that game, we will not be using UED Commander mode. We will be playing it throughout the entire production in English. So uh, enjoy that. 
I will catch you guys on the next LP, whatever that may be. I don't think it'll be the 2010 edition. I think I'll take a break from Metro for a bit. Hopefully that way I'll forget some of the stuff and so some of it will be fresh. But really this game was an ugly, inconsistent mess of a, of a title. It had, setting had some potential, sort of like Prey, but um, at the end of the day it just didn't cut it. It, it didn't have the guts.